My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCahn.com. Welcome to this week's edition of Digital Oil & Gas. My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm joined today by Ian Burgess, who is a tech entrepreneur um, from, where are you based, Ian? So, uh, yeah, mostly Toronto. We have, uh, I, I spend not quite half my time here in Calgary. Uh, we have a, we just opened office in Houston, uh, and we're probably split a third Calgary and Houston, two-thirds in Toronto, that's right. where our developers are. Fantastic. Uh, and the company, your, uh, what's the name of the company that you've... Uh, I know it's a Norwegian name, you told me. <laughs> so we say Validera. I think if you look up the Norwegian thing, it's Validera. Validera, but, uh, which means what? What is it? Validate. Validate. In Norwegian and Danish, I believe. Right. So there's probably a story to that. Yeah. I mean, the story is that we were looking for something that had a brand name validation, and we wanted something that was uh, fairly simple to remember, succinct but also available on Nuance, oh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and that's what we came up with. Well, uh, on the, uh, the other way to look at that is the Nor Norwegians aren't particularly aggressive in <laughs> landing yeah. uh, digital properties, so yeah. there's a clue for everyone out there who's thinking they might do a, a digital startup. Look for um, uh, look for a foreign um, foreign words that have uh, intrinsic meaning in, 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 in the language of, of your interest. Um, and look outside of English. Yeah, a lot of the words are taken. So, what's your role at the at uh, Validator? What do you do there? So, uh, I'm one of the founders. I'm the technical guy. So, my role right now is president and CTO. Um, the more uh, you know, the more busy we've gotten, the the more I've been working on uh, CTO type stuff, and the more my co-founder and and the finance team have really taken over some of the the more um, management type stuff. Um, but uh, Basically, our team is divided into three roughly equal parts. There's the business development and industry experts, industry experts, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then we have the developers, which is uh, you know building all of the uh, software products, and then we have what we call solution engineering and analytics. Um, so these are people that are building the algorithms that get built into the product, but they're also uh, the data scientists that you'll meet usually in the first three months of a client engagement mm -hmm. where we're getting into the data and we're finding all the unique um, the unique problems and ha figuring out how to fit those into the in, into into the, the the way our software works. And I always have a saying that uh, uh, data science done the first time is called consulting and uh, <laughs> data engineering done the first time is called data entry. Um and uh, <laughs> as a as a former consultant, I'm I'm sort of mildly offended and, and deeply amused. So that works both ways. So uh, yeah. That's so good. so generally, the uh, the you know the the as my I guess operational home, aside from the, the overall strategic kind of stuff and management kind of stuff, is uh, is on this uh, solution engineering analytics team, and uh, our whole uh, goal really is to be able to take in new problems um, and then basically productize what we've learned so that uh, a fixed size team can keep taking on new problems, but also our product is continually getting better and better. And scale it up. And exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your background, by the way? Like, where did you, where, I mean, sure. Yeah. So I, I uh, did my undergrad in math and physics at Waterloo. Um, I basically went straight to grad school. So I did my PhD uh, at Harvard um, in optics and fluidics. Um, Funnily enough, I was starting. Uh, I started out being interested in quantum computing and some of the material science problems associated with quantum computing, and then uh, I ended up uh, looking into adaptive materials for that, and then somehow got sidetracked in uh, sensors and diagnostics. And then uh, originally, how I got introduced to the oil and gas industry was um, after I graduated. I stayed in a, uh, a research institute still at Harvard. Mm -hmm. um, we were, and it was more technology focused and we were looking at different applications, different kind of uh, testing technologies, um, some medical, some uh, consumer type applications. And then uh, after the Lac Mégantic uh, rail disaster, um, we got a cold call from the U.S. Department of Transportation to, uh, and then they gave us a small project to look at um, uh, how to improve crude testing as it related to rail transportation, and then yeah. So people aren't familiar with the Lac Megantic issue. This was a um, a rail disaster in Quebec. Lots of people died. 
the uh, rail shipment was at the top of a hill, brake failed. Uh, I think the rail cars were filled with um, highly volatile light petroleum products. And uh, on, on impact in the town, it created a fireball and lots of people passed away. So. Yeah, so what was interesting is, is after that, um, Transport Canada and the US DOT ran a, uh, uh, an audit on a few uh, shipments that uh, come by rail mm. and found, I think it was in the first 16 shipments, 13 of them were off spec on uh, light ends. And, uh, and so that was, that was really what sparked the interest on understanding uh, what operational issues lead to this and how we can improve measurement. Um, so basically... Uh, I operated on that project effectively as a consultant for about a year and then uh, really got to understand uh, what the field guy's day-to-day life looks like when it comes to measurement and quality and also how that impacts um, commercial decisions and operational decisions. Um, and uh, and then, then one of the main things we noticed just was that the communication was difficult in many companies and, uh, and it was very hard to get data the right data to the right person in time for them to be able to make an informed decision. And so that was really the, I'd say the original conceptualization of uh, the problem upon which we built uh, validator when we but first that, started. But this to be honest, though, that sounds really general though, getting the right data to the right persons to make the right decision. So the, what was the specific business problem that you've been, you know, that you were targeting? So, I mean, if the product is off Let's, spec, if I use the, 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 the real car example, the product is off spec. So someone must have had some data that told them when they put, you know, theoretically, when the product went into the tank, it was on spec. And you come out the other end and it's off spec. So, which meant it went into the tank off spec, but the measurement was incorrect. Yeah, so so I guess if you're asking, you know, what yeah. specific data we're interested in. What is the problem you're solving is really the issue. Yeah, so, so, so we're interested, our whole company right now is, is uh, devoted towards... Uh, quality optimization and measurement optimization. Um, and, you know, quality is really interesting in, uh, in commodities markets in general, particularly liquid commodities markets, right? Because, um, you know, if you compare a, a market for a commodity like to a market for consumer goods, um, the, there is this real difference where, you know, you may have some of the same problems where, hey, you know, do I have enough access to buyers? What's the efficiency in the supply chain? All that yeah. stuff. But you also have this really weird property where uh, the actual value of your commodity is very path dependent on uh, how you get it to market, right? So I always liken it to the example of, you know, if uh, I, you and I were sellers on Amazon and you were selling cherries and I was selling tomatoes, mm-hmm. um, it doesn't matter whether it was the system before Amazon or it was Amazon. Um, you know, I pack my ch- tomatoes in a box, you pack your cherries in a box. They uh, go sit next to each other in a truck and they go into a bigger warehouse and they go into another truck and they come out. At the end of the day, my buyer buys tomatoes and your buyer buys cherries, right? But um, with crude, you know, I, I make tomatoes and you make cherries and we go to the first midstreamer and now it's cherry tomatoes. And, and, That's true. It's all the and, yeah. <laughs> and so now I can never sell my cherries as cherries uh, downstream once I've made that first decision to um, blend with your tomatoes. It, it also um, is one of the reasons why the industry struggles to do things like create ethical crude. Because the minute you, if you had a crude product, which you wanted to articulate or sell to the market as ethical, i.e. comes from a, a country with a proper human rights record and so forth, you can't track it. When yeah. it gets into the supply chain, it's all blended up. Yeah, so so our whole thought was that uh, you see a number of problems, right? If you look at the, uh, you know, upstream, you have uh, liquidity problems um, in some areas. You, you see that also with certain refiners have, have liquidity problems where they have unable, they, they have trouble accessing the barrels that they want reliably. Mm-hmm. Um, you then also have these problems like lag magnetic where you have spec problems, Um or, I mean, the most recent example was the organic chlorides in Russia, right, which has shut oh, down yeah. one of our major yeah. pipelines. Yep. Yep. Um, there was a recent one where, uh, was it somewhere in Korea, the huge tankers were turned around because of quality problems? Yep. Um, when I was in Australia, there were problems with um, military-grade um, fuels uh, being off-spec. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you see these all over the place. Yeah. Um, and I, I uh, in in my old research days, I, I had some experience too with uh, you know on the biofuel side, and you see it's kind of the same thing. Mm-hmm. So um, the upshot was is we thought that you know in some ways the crude oil uh, market 
and uh, you know, petroleum market in general has a lot of the same pl- problems that you've seen in other logistics type markets, right? You know, kind of the, the market for consumer goods pre Amazon. Um, but uh, this quality was a really unique problem, uh, and it seemed to be the problem that uh, underpinned a lot of the other problems. And you wanted to, if you wanted to really affect macroscopic change in the way you know these uh, these supply chains were organized, then you 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 need to you need to understand quality really well. And and so that's that's really the you know the core mission of the first product we built, Valor 360, was really. How can I make it easy for oil companies to understand the quality that they have? Um, and uh, and then once you do that, our our, uh, our second product, Validator Alpha, is basically how do I now contextualize that information with market information and get insights on you know how I can change the path dependence of my path to market or my path from market um, such that I optimize my netbacks. Mm-hmm. Um, so really connecting the commercial and the 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 operational mm-hmm. side. Selecting amongst midstream pathways to market, tankage potential, um, the, these are the uh, the pathway exactly questions. Yeah. The midstreamers, it's an interesting question, you know, are, that you would think the midstream industry would be highly motivated to optimize to product quality, but in fact, I think their metrics drive them to optimize to their assets, in which case quality is might, might not be the, the, the primary driver for um, for for their operations, is that accurate? Or? Uh, uh, yeah, not, I, somewhere between not really and kinda. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I think midstream probably more than certainly more than the upstream segment of the market. Midstream has known for a while that quality is important, right? Mm. Um, I would see the assets that a midstream company has as you know, in one sense, it's a constraint, right? You put a terminal in this location, it's now there. Yep. So everything that you do has to be weighed against the implied costs yeah. of, you know, the physical assets. Um, but uh, but they also, you know, offer, the, the quality certainly falls into opportunity for midstream assets, right? There's a reason why uh, lots of midstream assets are built in Cushing because you have a lot of liquidity Option, there, and right? Yeah, for um, and, and for yeah. sure, quality is built into that. Mm-hmm. Um but uh, you know, on so so uh, yeah, I, I would say that that um, that midstream generally has is, is they've known quality is important for a long time, right? I think the the challenge that uh, midstream companies face is basically vertical and hor- horizontal segmentation in the market, right? If the entire supply chain was owned by a single midstream company, then there was all kinds of things that you could potentially do mm. to uh, to optimize that path dependence perfectly. But that's not how it's going to work in a, a well-functioning it's market, it's right? Not North America's market. Um, and so once you you have this segmentation, right? You have a horizontal segmentation um, that means you know oftentimes midstream companies might have the, the the best plan for what they're going to do in a given month, but then it gets thrown, uh, you know, they get thrown a curveball when the producer delivers something that was not expected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then you also see you know segmentation within the vertical where you know there is six or seven or eight midstream companies operating in any given uh, segment of the supply chain in any given ge- geographic region. Um, and that gives, uh, you know, optionality for producers and refiners and other midstream companies further up or further down in the supply chain. But uh, it also adds to the opacity, right? Because if you're any given company, you only know what you know and you don't know what everybody yep, else does. Yeah, yep. it's not, like, not a transparent market. For yeah. All, yeah it's very, what, so what exactly does Validare do? Like, how does it, what is the quality... What is the, the 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 measurement that you're doing to improve? Sure, that's, that's different. Yeah, so so uh, so Validator 360 is really focused on your operations. If you're a midstream company, if you're a refiner, if you're a producer, right? Um, and uh, really, the, the 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 problem that we wanted to solve is, is this communication problem as relates to quality, right? So mm-hmm. so is you have a zillion instruments out there. You usually have five or six different software systems that you might use, and one of the software systems, in air quotes, might be you know a guy running around with centrifuges and writing yes, stuff down on a sheet, exactly. right? Yep, yep, um, yep. And then you got your third party labs that's sending you emails. You got spreadsheets all over the place, um, and uh, and the problem with with uh, with all that complexity and the 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 slow communication is first of all mistakes get missed, right? Because it's just you're you're drowning in a sea of data without context. 
Um, yep. but, but also just the feedback loop is slow, right? So you have, um, you know, disputes. If you have, uh, if I sell you oil and we disagree on what the measurement is, so it's going to take months to resolve as we have to dig back through and figure out what the yeah. whole, you know, yeah. audit trail was. Yeah. Um, but even on the marketing side, right, it's very common to see the slower the communication gets, the more marketing teams basically, they could be using three month old data to be making whatever their decisions are. And maybe they're making a sell or a blend or whatever. And then they just get completely blindsided um, by, uh, by what actually went through the plant. And you see that a lot. Um, in uh, when you when when a company looks at their own financials and they look at the difference between you know their paper blend or their paper mark the, the, their, what they nominated and what they actually got in terms of uh, netbacks, um, a big gap. There's a big gap. Big gap. Yeah. Um, and so so Validator 360 it basically consolidates all of that data into a single cloud based platform. We uh, are hardware agnostic because we don't want you to have to rip up all your hardware to uh, to to get that that single source of truth. There's a couple of cases where we um, have gotten in the hardware business a little bit and have designed some hardware with with partners to to help fill out the holes in that uh, data picture. Um, but uh, once so, so then once you have that uh, that single source of truth that anyone can access at any time in real time, whether you're a field guy, a marketing guy, or a quality guy in Calgary, um, then we can add tools to make decision making easier and faster. So one of the first kind of tools that we have are effectively workflow management tools, right? So it uh, allows the field guys to plan their days. It also allows people in Calgary to know what the field guys are doing and to know when things have been done, when to expect things. Um, and then on the analytics side, um, we have um, really two pieces of analytics on the on the 360 that uh, help our clients improve the the accuracy of their uh, and the completeness of the, the the picture of what's going through their plant. So the first kind of um, uh, the first kind of analytics we have, I call basically virtual metering, right? Which is there are some measurements that are really easy and cheap to make. There are some measurements that are important, but not so easy or not so cheap to make. Um, but uh, with once you've aggregated all this data, can you start to make models? And we use combinations of physical models and statistical models, which I can go into, you know, that methodology if you're interested. Um, but uh, we, we, we use these, the, the, these, these data to build a model that says, okay, um, if you were to measure this in real time, this is what it would be. And then we actually create that as an instrument on the platform that has, you know, just like a real instrument, a virtual a instrument. Virtual instrument. Yeah, so uh, a virtual instrument yeah. has a huh. it has a value. Yeah. It has a uncertainty range, just like a real instrument will have an uncertainty range. And you can track calibrations, right? Because you know the, the last exactly. Let's say I'm predicting vapor pressure somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you can tell when it was last measured. When did I last get a point to check that model and build that feedback? Right. Um, right. So that's the first kind of thing that that uh, that kind of analytics we have. And the second kind of analytics um, we do, which is uh, uh, fairly common, is basically analytics on how to optimize workflow. So a classic problem um, for a gathering system is you could be taking in from a hundred oil from a hundred different places, and you have to combine this up in a way that uh, you know makes rational sense for the market. Um, and to do that well, you want to minimize the uncertainty of the sum of all the hundred uh, uh, producers that you have. But you maybe only have three people that can go take tests, and so you don't have time to measure all one hundred. Let's say every week. Right. Right. Um, so which ones do you measure? Uh, and uh, and so. Hmm. In that case, uh, effectively, what we spit out is, is a list of recommended workflow yeah. suggestions. Here's the ones to yeah. touch. Yeah, yeah. Um, Based on their criticality, I suppose, or their, you know, their, their, their where they, where they're, you know, last time they were looked at, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I guess the last thing, which is somewhat analytics, somewhat communication, is we we obviously then uh, also work with. Um, building visualization tools that match what's relevant to the client's operations based on all the data. So there's a lot of stuff in our software that's configurable in the sense that you can look at an analyze page, you can look at any two streams and any two instruments. And um, But sometimes you have one or two things that you want to look at all the time. Um, and so then uh, we'll create those as pre-saved uh, dashboards, sure. essentially, yeah, yeah, yeah. where you can uh, you know click the link to see how these things are, are trending. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. 
If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.